said last time. So a sheaf <coughs> is a, a functor from open sets to, well, let's say, a building groups. satisfies two axes. Standard axioms, so uh, if you follow an axiom, so you have a covering you okay, alpha in your space. And suppose you have sections S alpha section I call them sections already elements of the sheaf on U alpha with uh, appropriate restrictions. So from U alpha to U alpha beta and S alpha is the same thing. U beta, U alpha beta, S beta. So they restrict correctly. Uh, then there exists a global thing. This is a covering uh, of some set U, open set, and the restriction of this thing from U to U alpha equals S alpha. So the restriction property, <coughs> well, so to speak, the building property. You build them out of local things, but global things. And the second one is uh, the other way around. So if if uh, you have two things globally, and the restriction <coughs> are equal for all elements of the cover. Full circle. There's no beta. Hmm? There's no bit. There's no beta. It's, it's alpha and both of them. Hi. Hi. Okay. I'm just reviewing so I didn't miss it. What did you say, Nina? It's alpha and both of them. Nina, dear, it's alpha and both of them. Just put an alpha and a beta. Ah, thanks. <laughs> All up and then. Okay, so that's a sheaf. And we're starting to take some main examples for us. So the first main example. trivial, so there's a covering, covering of the base. This is the three image of this, of this open set. <coughs> and this thing is uh, biomorphically equivalent to U alpha cross Cn. By mapping, uh, well, I, maybe I'll, I'll map it uh, this way. <coughs> In 
in the usual sense. So this is in that in P alpha. And of course, the vector bundle, the vector space structure on each fiber is well defined. So that means that if you go in the, by phi alpha and you come back by phi beta, then you get a mapping of, uh, of u alpha beta um, cross cn to u alpha beta cross cn. And this is a vector bundle thing. So what happens here is, say, p and z goes to p g alpha beta uh, of p. Well, let's, let's, let's call this a vector. This is a nice vector p. So the key is this is g alpha beta this is g l n. So the the so the, the, is a mapping. So from u alpha beta. And, C. and this mapping is holomorphic, of course. So what is E? Hmm? What is E in order to So E is a complex manifold with this property, with these coordinates. So it has nothing to do with the part? What? I mean, I, I believe this is a classical setting for a yeah, complex I, vector bundle, but it, it has to have something with the thing above. I mean, this is a classical setting. It has nothing to do with sheaves or... No. So, so, so far, this is just a whole bunch of vector bundle. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm just reviewing what... I, this is a differentiable vector bundle, but the main point is this mapping is a whole bunch. Oh, okay. I just repeat it for, for uh, so people who haven't thought about this before, what the point is. The pre-image... The pre-image... Um, this, this, this mapping here, it's a holomorphic mapping on this pre-image. This is the local trivialization. And it has to be compatible. Uh, well, the, the, the coordinate change is this. And you want it to be holomorphically compatible and linearly compatible. So that means that this thing is a mapping in the GLNC, holomorphic. So holomorphic value matrix. OK? So that's a holomorphic vector bundle, and you can build these things with these, these things, transition matrices. These things are called transition matrices. And as, as we know, that if you have such transition matrices which satisfy a certain two rules, so it has to be alternating. And uh, then compatibility. If you go around the clock, on an overlap of three sets. <clears throat> so this is a differentiable vector bundle where everything inside is whole one. That's, that's all I was going to say, okay? <clears throat> well, I just wanted to remind you of that. But the fundamental point is that now, uh, we have a funny notation. So E script E maybe is the sheaf uh, of uh, holomorphic uh, sections of E. So that means say script E of U is the set of sections over U of E. That's my notation for sections, but I should emphasize one time at least I mean holomorphic. So that just means that if you take something here, it is a section, so S maps the base U, so over U only. So we restrict the bundle to U, I didn't write it here, it's restricted to U, into the bundle space with uh, projection. And this thing is holomorphic equals identity on each. So the sheaf, sometimes I say the sheaf in terms of local holomorphic sections. So for every open set, you have sections. And you have the restriction mapping, you have everything inside. Okay? Given an open set, the vector bundle. And 
set. We restrict the bundle to the open set. Here, of course, we always have the zero section. And the section then is just what it is. It's a section, but only over U. Okay. So over U, all possible sections. Locally, you have a huge number of sections because it's locally trivial. Right. Locally, it's just, uh, where is it? Here, it's just a product. So you have all essentially just uh, the CN value of all the map. And globally, you may have some, you may, may not. So this is uh, a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. And the sheaf, the sheaf here, uh, set E, is locally three. Namely, uh, if, uh, say, E restricted to U is trivial, so we take a trivialization on some open set U, then that means the E restricted to U is nothing more than, than the product of U plus CN by the trivialization. And sections of this set can correspond to just holomorphic mappings from U to CN. Holomorphic mappings from U to CN, and that is uh, an n-fold product uh, of the holomorphic functions on U. That's not a notation, n-fold product of holomorphic functions on U. An element here, as you know, is just n homomorphic functions. Sometimes we emphasize the, 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 where we are, x, and the open set here. So we say it's locally free. Okay? And we say it's locally free uh, of rank n. So locally, the, the way to talk about this thing is locally free of rank n. Obviously, if you have if you have two isomorphisms of the sheaf uh, on so uh, if you have uh, say pi or maybe I'll even do it right here p uh, uh, alpha uh, from a, a sheaf say uh, a sheaf uh, on u alpha to uh, n copies of the sheaf on u uh, on, on u alpha sheaf isomorphism uh, for covering u alpha. So if you start with a locally free sheaf of rank n, then of course. <laughs> What you have is exactly what I had before. Something like, uh, probably I had the wrong, uh, well, it doesn't matter. So you have, I'm going to go this way and back. So, uh, okay, phi beta inverse phi alpha is an isomorphism of uh, uh, over u alpha beta of the sheaf n, and that means. This is an, it takes a, a, a it takes functions takes n, a mapping of n functions to a mapping of n functions. So let me write here the isomorphism. That means that this is a this is just a matrix p alpha beta this thing. So in and back is just a matrix because it has to take a vector of length n holomorphic functions to a vector of length and holomorphic functions and isomorphism. So this is just a mapping from U alpha beta G L and C holomorphic because it has 
has to take vectors to vectors and it has to be holomorphic. So you see that what we have here is, is the, the fact that rank and holomorphic vector bundles That's the same thing as locally free sheets of rank n. Okay. I like to think, uh, quite honestly, in the geometric terms. I think you give up. I think. You know, you have local free sheets, you have these isomorphisms and so on, local, local trivialization, and here you have the transition matrices and all that. But you see, when you have a vector bundle, you really have the geometry of the vector bundle space. It's really a, it's a complex manifold with a lot of geometry on it. So it's, it's the same thing, but I think this viewpoint is, is somehow a very strong viewpoint. You will see uh, later on that that really has a strong uh, consequence. Now, let me say that there are more important sheets than just these. So I should have an example of an important sheet uh, which is not a vector bundle. Well, many such examples, but this is a, a something that's very, very close to a vector bundle and motivates well, this is a very important, another concept that we will discuss briefly. Namely, let's, <coughs> let's look at a singularity and let's look at let's look at the tangent bundle of this curve, this is, for example, let's take a precise curve, uh, something like this. This is a simple minor curve in C2, C, and this is the origin, so I'll say P0 to make things. And this is the curve C. <clears throat> then, of course, you can draw some picture. <laughs> you, should, you can draw some picture. Uh, of a tangent space here. And now you need to decide what that is. Okay. So uh, the best way to decide what that is is um, the following. So I need to find, so this is a, a point here, say P. And now I look at the local ring here at P. <coughs> and I look at the uh, derivatives. Remember the tangent vectors are derivatives here on the function. So, so this is the, this is the uh, local ring, uh, local power series, uh, so local homomorphic functions at that point. Uh, <coughs> so what this thing is, this is the, the, uh, the ring at, C, at C2 so this is C2 here. So this is the ring C2 at that point, modulo the ideal, uh, uh, the defining ideal at that point, so which is this defined by this equation at this point. So that's what that is. Those are the, lo those are the local holomorphic functions. And now you want to know what is a, a tangent vector. So a tangent vector is, uh, is something that differentiates functions of force first uh, here. So a tangent ve vector is uh, uh, on, a, say, the derivations of this local ring with values in C. Let me emphasize that. So that means that if you multiply two functions, we've talked about this before many, many times. <laughs> yeah. One gets tired of writing the Leibniz rule. And, and 
uh, this is what it is. Now that's a manifold at that point. So you all know about me exactly how to compute out the, the, the derivations of the manifold. So uh, this is, uh, so let me just, just say, this, this says that the tangent bundle, the holomorphic tangent bundle of the curve minus the bad point P0? P0. Hmm? Uh, here, you see, this is just a manifold. So you just write down what, this, what these things is the power series in one variable. So there's a power series in one variable. The derivation is just DDZ in that variable once you've decided what the variable is. So this is, this is, just, this is just a rank one vector bundle say, of, this, of this thing. Uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, but restricted to here. This is a rank one vector bundle. Holomorphic vector bundle. Okay? And you can have fun, if you, particularly if you like uh, algebra, to look now at P0. So P0, it, the, the local ring, so this thing at P0 is just power series, say convergent power series, uh, uh, I don't know, convergent power series in Z and W. Uh, you can just think of polynomial, it doesn't matter. In Z and W, modulo the ideal generated by this, this equation. Just write it down. That's it. And then you like algebra, and now you compute. You compute the derivations on this on this thing. These are the what are the derivations? And the derivations of this thing. These derivations with values in the complex numbers. is two-dimensional. It jumps. That is the semi-continuity that happens here. The smooth points. The tangent. Tangent space is exactly what you think it is. You look down at the local functions. Their power series in so and so many variables. If it's dimension k, their power series in k variables. And then the, the derivation is just the partial derivatives in those k variables, just like we have in real, over the reals. However, when you come to a singularity, this thing jumps. So this is the, the tangent sheet. The tangent sheaf, so the tangent sheaf that you will see is just the derivations of the local ring with values in C. This sheaf, this sheaf is a vector bundle if and only if. And this is an example. I mean, of course, the tangent model, whatever it is, has to be a good sheet. I mean, if it's not a good sheet, we don't know what we're doing. So this, there are many such sheaves that appear that uh, that are good sheaves and important sheaves that are not vector bundles. That's that's my only point here. Okay. Let me forget it. That was a quick introduction. Holomorphic vector bundles. Obviously, locally free because it's just local the product. This sheaf at the origin is not locally free. It jumps. <clears throat> now, Grauer, for example, had some idea of introducing a generalized holomorphic vector bundle, <laughs> allowing jumps, called a linear fiber space. Just uh, generically, it's a vector bundle, and then, then uh, on lower dimensional sets and so on. You can do this. But the good notion uh, is, I just want to tell you this, I'm not going to dwell on it, is the notion of a coherent sheet. Of OX modules. So we'll start with the complex space. Here's the sheet in terms of holomorphic functions. 
and we want to come here and see from the OX modules. Vector bundle will be such. And it's this. So let's say a coherent sheaf of F modules. It's so a bit sheaf. Okay. And locally, you hope it's locally free. So you look at it locally, let us say on some U alpha, and you say, voila, it looks locally free. Uh, uh, there's a subjective map, so locally free there would be an isomorphism on U alpha, right? But you can't ask for that, you can only ask for it being subjective. Here you could sit, sit down and see that it, there is really a subjective map here from O2, two powers of this to this thing. Now the trouble is, at least this subjective map will have a kernel, okay? This will have a kernel, and the statement of coherence is that this kernel is also finitely generated. See, this is finitely generated because here are the generators. This thing will be generated by two generators here. Yeah, but there will be relations. So you, re you require that, that the relationship, the kernel of this thing, is also finitely generated. Uh, but not free necessarily? No. So what you get is a resolution of, of this thing like this. So a coherent sheaf is, is it's finally generated, so that's great. Okay, so it really looks like uh, what it is, is simply a vector bundle with relations. <laughs> but the trouble is, you better, the relation sheaf should be finally generated. You don't leave this category of, of finite generatedness. Okay, I don't want to dwell on that. But a key example. is, for example, let uh, x be an analytic subspace, so to, defined by local holomorphic equations in some domain, say, in Cn. So you have some domain in Cn, and you have uh, an analytic subspace of that defined by local equations. So here's some terrible thing. So x close analytic subspace. And of course, it is key, the, 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 the sheaf of germs of this thing is the sheaf of D modulo the sheaf that vanishes on X. That's obviously what you want. The function is here local holomorphic. It's just a restriction locally of a holomorphic function. So you restrict, and the kernel of restrictions is ideal. And the key theorem, I think it's Avoca, is this ideal is coherent. So when you're making all this stuff, you don't leave this category of coherent sheaves, but you leave the category of vector bundles. What happens if the uh, finite degenerate model? Hmm? And what does it mean that ideal is coherent? I just wrote the definition. It's an O module. No, it's, as an, as an it's, module, it's, fine. it's, it's an o, o module. I mean, really, we're dealing only with uh, okay. o, 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 o. so it's finitely generated, and the relations are finitely generated, and so on. Okay. okay. So, so for any finitely generated thing here like this, these current relations, yeah. okay. you have to prove all that. That's a serious theory. Okay. I, I, I don't want to uh, dwell on this. It's uh, not too important for us at this elementary stage. You should just keep in mind the message of these first remarks is that sheaves are important. We've seen already. Vector bundles and local, uh, locally free sheaves the same thing. That's great. But you leave this category. And I gave you two examples where you do leave this category, and the reason you leave this category is things degenerate and get singularities. You can't avoid it. Okay. okay pardon me for this abstract diversion, but I think it's just at least so you know, if you ever read a book or something, what, what, why this big deal about coherent sheaves.
And as I say, uh, Broward wrote a, in one of his beautiful papers, uh, showed us that in fact, that's exactly what happened. It's a vector bundle and then someplace on a small analytic set, it jumps in dimension and so on. So there's really a stratification of the, of the, of the complex space X. Vector bundle, jump, vector bundle, jump, vector bundle, jump. So it's something like that. But actually when we work, we use resolutions more than anything. Let me comment on a, on a, a little comment. You see, this sheaf obviously has a topology. Right? Holomorphic functions have the usual topology. It means convergence on compact sets, uniform convergence on compact sets. So this has a topology, this has a topology, this has a topology. And you can prove that it's a unique topology even though there are many such resolutions. So uh, this gives us these, these, these this gives us an opportunity discussing topology. Maybe I, sh I should underline that since, at least in this lecture, I have not underlined it. So the topology uh, on, it doesn't matter, on some, on the space is uniform conversions on complex subsets. Compact subset, uniform convergence uh, is the good topology for continuous functions. Yeah. But a uh, uniform limit of holomorphic functions is, is holomorphic on that compact subset. But you're talking about big open subsets, so you'll never get uniform convergence on the big open subsets. That's very important to underline. You get uniform convergence on compact subsets. So you see, this is not a Banach space. The uniform convergence on compact subsets for, for, for continuous functions is a, a, a perfectly good Banach space, right? You have a supernormal. Right? This is not normal, this topology. So and you probably know that, that this is a, a this has a, so this has a fresh imagine. Seminars, you must use the seminars to so use the seminars. So that's the topology on that, and of course then the topology on, on this stuff here is just uh, topology on the end. Okay, that's something, uh, elementary introduction to the important things of sheets. Okay, so now, uh, how do these, how do line bundles arrive? Now, I didn't say what a line bundle is, so L is a line bundle.
this seems silly that after all this general stuff, I talk about rank one vector models, line models. So I hope you understand where we are. We have a line bundle space L over X, complex space or complex manifold for us. Locally over some set, it is, it is trivial. So you have U alpha cross the phi alpha cross C being the trivialization here. Right? This is the trivialization of this line bundle. Now you get the G alpha betas. Now U alpha beta, the, the transition things go into GL1C. GL1C is miraculously C sharp. Right? And that means that G, G alpha beta is a holomorphic function on U alpha beta. So it goes from this to C star, which vanishes nowhere. So this is notation. So O star X is the sheaf uh, of uh, nowhere zero homomorphic functions. <clears throat> this is an important special case. I underline a stupid remark that is absolutely fundamental. That this thing is a beauty. Yes, that means we're dealing here with a sheaf of abelian groups, not a sheaf of highly non-abelian groups in the case of GLN, right? N bigger than one. Okay. This is a very, very special case that is extremely important. So it may seem trivial, but I will never, never forget, I attended a lecture of Fritz Hitzebuch in Göttingen one time. Now this is a man who proved absolutely fundamental theorems in mathematics in the 1950s that involved all sorts of things, everything you can think of, and he said the most important thing for him was the definition of a line bundle. It was a big breakthrough to make precise what the good object. This is a good object for studying what we call divisors. So, <clears throat> the key point here, and I'll explain this in detail. Line bundles, close connection of line bundles and divisors. Keep in mind a line bundle has geometric structure. What I'm about to talk about, you see very little geometry, at least at first. So there are two kinds of divisors. Two kinds. basic definitions, the Cartier, I, I meet Cartier quite often in various places around the world. I haven't seen him for a few years. I hope he's still living. He's not a very old guy. <laughs> André V died at a rather old age, over 90 years ago. Not so long ago, maybe five or six, seven years ago. Yes, these are both members of Bourbaki. And they were, a, they, Bourbaki is fundamental in this, in this regard. You should not exaggerate and go around Bourbaki and Bourbaki and everything's abstract and all that stuff. You should not do that. 
But you should look what's in Bobaki. The right notions are there, and this is an example of people in Bobaki. So let me start from a naive viewpoint. So the, 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 the vague viewpoint is in some sense uh, uh, the, 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 the simplest viewpoint. Let's look at it. So X is a complex space, or whatever you need, complex manifold. And we look at uh, H1 to H, say, K poles, one dimensional, one co dimensional. Call them hypersurfaces because the hypersurface you usually think of as co dimensional one. Okay. So you have these hypersurfaces. And a V divisor will support here. There's a formal linear com combination uh, N1H1. where the NJ uh, are uh, introduced. So it means hypersurfaces with formal weights, which are multiplicities. You can imagine they occur at these multiplicities. It's hard to imagine negative, but, but uh, this, they really also occur. This is a Bay divisor. <clears throat> now, please recall well, an example. And this will be fundamental for our discussion. So X, uh, 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 one dimensional. Surface. Maybe a hole here and something like this. Maybe some genus here. And you have finally many points on there. Uh, well, they could, you could have infinitely many, you no, know, but we only want to have finitely many. So, uh, <clears throat> okay, I think I want to restrict to only finitely many. Um, so, P1. PK, notice a point is co dimension one in one dimension. Right? <laughs> Sorry. So then what we have here is points with multiplicity. Yeah. And this has already occurred. We have a branch cover, you have the, number, the points in the fiber over a point, and then you have the multiplicities of the, of the branch. So this really has already occurred for us. So very, very important notion, obviously. So this is the notion of a main device. Now, You think and hope that a divisor can be defined locally by a function. Let's look at this silly example in the case of Riemann surfaces.
So let's take, it doesn't matter, let's take x equal to unit disk. Just take x, just for fun, take x equal to the unit disk. Here's zero. And now this is the point, let's, let's just make call this p0 so you don't get confused, right? And now let's look at the divisor, the Bay divisor, n times p0. Okay. This thing is defined, doesn't matter whether n is positive or negative, by z to the n. Right? It is a function whose vanishes or whatever its order is n at 0. Right? So you see, if x is smooth and one-dimensional, Very good. I mean, this is a, absolutely, I absolutely completely agree with you. It's not particularly if I take something compact and, and so on, right? Yeah. So that, that's one of the fundamental problems in life, is exactly the global question here, okay? Right? But if it's one-dimensional, then let me just write here, mean eyes, yeah? If it's one-dimensional, every, every Bay divisor is locally defined, and this is the eyes worry. By meromorphic functions. See this can have a pull here. I'm, I'm allowing a pull or Now let me just really carefully look at what you're just saying there. <clears throat> Let's draw a picture here, say, of something not compact. Even, not even this is so obvious. Huh? It's, I, I believe that I, I see here the problem of given a manifold constructible morphic function. I, I see it again here, the problem. How do you construct the function? Like exactly. Exactly. It's, it's exactly the point. Let, so let's let's I want to really just formulate everything you just said on the blackboard, okay? Okay? So the first thing is, let, let, let's, just, let's just take some example, it doesn't matter what. Say, I don't know, some, some remote surface, maybe you can back. Let's take uh, P1 here, P2 here, P3, well, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Probably one point would be enough to exemplify this, okay? And now let's take disks around here that are disjoint. So let's let ui, which is isomorphic to say the unit disk, uh, be disks uh, about uh, pi, which pi corresponds to zero in the disk. This is a coordinate disk. Right. Then, uh, uh, then and, and let's see, this is ui I equals, and let, let's say u zero is, is the rest, x minus the set. What I'm going to do here is first of all emphasize what the word locally means. So what the word locally means is well, probably globally you have almost no chance because you proved in the first lecture that the degree should be the same. So if the function has one in one point and two in the other point, then it's over. I mean, you cannot do anything. It's over. Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, let me repeat uh, what yeah, I said. You, you, globally, you have almost no chance, is what he said, because there are obstructions such as if you if you have a meromorphic function, the number of zeros added up equals the number of pulls added up. That's what you're saying. So if you're imposing all zeros or something, right, there's no chance, right? But maybe I've imposed some negatives, some positive, maybe I'll luck out. 
Now, let's just say locally first what are we dealing with, okay? So what we're dealing with here, this thing, I, I, I can always set this up this way that this corresponds to zero. And this gives us a collection of, this gives us say M1, M2, Mk, so I have to say meromorphic functions, On, uh, on UK, on U, uh, uh, on U1, on U, uh, uh, K, which we find the divider. You ask me what is this divisor? I say, look in UK, take this meromorphic function, that's it. That's just local. Okay? And let's let, let me just quote me out of here. You globally. Uh, there will be many. There will be obstructions to it. Globally means to find a global meromorphic function finding these devices. Right? You can be lucky, for example, if the Riemann surface is the sphere, right? and you have P1 through PK here, and oft, often we write for P1 through PK for the zeros, and M1 and, Q, and Q1 through QL for the poles. And now let's start thinking, and the multiplicity is N1, P1. This should be the zero divisor. This should be the zero. This is the question: Is, is this is the zero divisor of some meromorphic function? And and say you have poles given m1 q1, ml ql. This should be the pole the pole divisor of it. right? And you know the theorem, right? Number of poles equals number of zeros. So on P1, it's a pretty simple answer. Your obstruction is not so hard to understand. Okay? I will. That is one of the prime problems in all of algebraic geometry. Given some sort of divisor, is it globally defined in some, some way or another by a meromorphic function? And here, at least locally, it's a joke. I just cover the manifold with disjoint disks here. So on, on U0, I take uh, a M0 identically to 1, so it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any zeros or poles. Right? So that's it. No problem. So you see, in the case of a smooth Riemann surface, for example, I can deal with divisors locally uh, by meromorphic functions. And this is a very good thing. Going from local meromorphic description to global meromorphic description. This is one of the prime things. Going from local to global using functions. But that is not correctly defined. What? I mean, you define u0 to be the surface minus some points. Yeah. You already know locally near the point what the function is, and then you redefine it to be 1. I got it. So on the complement, the meromorphic function is 1. Yeah, but on the complement. There's no zeros in a pole. No, but on the complement of the point, the disk, not on the points. Oh, I'm sorry, but no, no, I, no, 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 no. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought this up. Look, what, what is, what are you looking for locally? Yeah, uh, globally. So we're looking for m such that m divided by m i equals f i, which is holomorphic. And it doesn't matter. So it has the M on UI has the prescribed poles, have zeros, right? That's the statement. That it's holomorphic and doesn't, doesn't vanish. So the statement on U0 is M divided by 1 is holomorphic and doesn't vanish. So it means it has no zeros or poles. Okay? So this is, this is a way of saying locally, you pres prescribe the zeros or poles of whatever you have by a meromorphic function. And you're looking for a global function 
so that it has the same zeros and poles. That's the statement when you divide it out, you get, okay, it's not going to be a one or something, it's, but it's going to be at least a function which does the vanish of the variable. Like, does it respect the, the condition of sticking together? Because I don't see it. I mean, if you zero intersect, like you see on, on the whole complement, it's one. But then you do, go locally and let's say it's one over z. No, it won't be. The, the, what, oh, you mean here? Yeah, it will not stick. No, but here, here it's also something that doesn't vanish. I'm not... So, okay, let, let's do what oh, you When you undefine it by mi, you, you get a m corresponding mi such that... The yeah, 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 yeah. On, on every open set you have an mi. Yeah, but... Uh, okay. Yeah. The condition is then m divided by mi. Okay, the, the condition is not that the function locally is mi. No, 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 no. It's, it, it, that's what I emphasize. Yeah. It's some function. But who cares what it is? It's just the key thing. It doesn't have any more zeros or poles. But is it possible that some UI and U they overlap? Then? Of course. And here they do. Okay? And we're going to get into that right away. But you can make them smaller. So that yeah, yeah, yeah. You're exactly right. But let's, let, uh, uh, this is exactly the point I want to discuss. It's possible they overlap, so you better watch out with that. Uh, we will watch out in a second, okay? Here, it turns out you don't have to worry about it. But in general, we have to work. So, anyway, uh, all I'm saying is, I'll go through it again. A main device is just some uh, finite combination of microservices with multiplicity. <laughs> in the zero dimension, one dimensional case, these are just points. And locally, we can define them by mirror morphic functions. So, this local global thing is really great from the point of view of functions. And now I'm going to define Cartier divisors by functions. And I will, I will. Professor, professor, I have a question about some terminology, but yeah. I don't understand why you call it divisor. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It must divide something. Usually, usually in, in a module or in a ring, you call the bad things divisors. <laughs> you see, you will see in a minute, okay? If these things will appear as denominators, well, well that, then you'll be happy. That's what you're saying. You already see it here. It's not very convincing at this stage, but in a second it will be convincing. You guys asked wonderful questions, and I'm very thankful. Okay, that was Bay. So here's Andre Bay. And now Cartier. And I will emphasize the, what you asked about Sintel. So X is a complex space, a complex manifold, but it's really... And U is a covering. except for Sentel's, where he was afraid. With m alpha divided by m beta, so this meromorphic function is not allowed to vanish anywhere identically. Otherwise, uh, I'm dividing here by a of zero. Yeah? Let's call this f alpha beta. Should be holomorphic and nowhere vanishing on u alpha beta. Now, you see, 
see, let's go, this was exactly the point you were worried about, let's go up here. So these things are disjoint, so there's no intersection. The only place there's intersection is u0, say, with u1. Okay. Now on u0, so that's the complement of this point. So what we have here is uh, m0 divided by m1. m0 is identically 1. m1 is effectively zeta sub n, n1. It looks like it has a pole, but it's not, this pole is not in this intersection. So there's no contradiction here in the way we define these things. But you see, in general, there will be in higher dimensions. Because if you have here, say, u alpha, and you have here u beta, okay? Now you have m alpha, let's, say, let's, let's do some craziness here. This gets really crazy. So maybe the polar set of m alpha um, looks like this. This is, say, the polar set of m alpha. Right? Why not? And say the zero set of m alpha maybe looks like this. So this is the zero set of m alpha. How could they intersect? Hmm? How could they intersect? The polar, we know that z divided by w, the polar and zero uh, set intersect at the origin. It's exactly that problem. Yeah, it's exactly, glad you mentioned that again. Yeah, there we are. Right? Yeah. This is the problem. This, so here there will be some blowout probably or something, some terrible stuff. All right, let me try, I'll have enough colors. Then we have to do the same thing over here. So there's some sort of stuff here. So this is, this is say, the polar set of, U beta, of M beta. But the condition here says that the polar set on the intersection, the polar set of the zero, uh, cancel of these two things. What's polar here and what's polar here cancels because this thing is holomorphic and doesn't match. So the way it looks is, is this. So it says, even counting multiplicity, for example, if this thing has multiplicity 79, then, then the other thing should have, has to have multiplicity here 79. Right? Because on the overlap, these things, the polar set really cancels out, even counting multiplicity. Okay? And the same thing here, uh, the, zero set, the zero set will uh, have to line up here. So the functions, the defining functions, don't line up. But that looks to be a little bit particular. What? It doesn't seem like this happens too often. It happens, what do you mean, what happens? Like the, the zero set and the polar set are at the same level, they think. Coordinate. I mean, I don't think is this a phenomenon that happens very often. I mean, is there a big family of functions that synthesize this? Sure. X. Sure. So <laughs> let, let's let's yes. So you give me. Well, do you do a little you, you think, you No, 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 no. You you're thinking you're, what you, you're thinking is in dimension one. So let's let's think of dimension two. Okay. So, you, so, okay, this is the condition. Okay, so this is the Cartier device. Uh, the point is that every Cartier divisor is, is a lot of the divisor. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that the polar set and the zero set of a Cartier divisor are well defined. So the polar and zero set of a Cartier divisor are well defined. Set on U alpha is this, 
this is the polar set on U alpha, here's the polar set on U beta, on the overlap they agree. So, uh, last question. In the value buzzer, you have finitely finite linear combinations. Right. When you have a function, I, I like this is a question, I don't know if it's true or not. If you have a function, can the like the, the polar set have the, like to be a countable union of and it's it's it's, yes, and, and uh, that's a, that's maybe if it's that's compact, a very that's a very should, reasonable thing. You should ask it to be compact or so. So if the manifold is non-compact, uh, just take the complex plane for example. So what you're what you're saying is if for example we take the integers in the complex plane. Hmm. You can make poles in them. Yeah, you can do all sorts of stuff, right? Hmm. And maybe Maybe, you see, this, this, this definition of Cartier allows that. Hmm. And I prefer here finiteness, but let me, let me react to your question by saying maybe infinite. Maybe only locally finite. That means on any compact set, you've, you've only got the finite. My question is a plausible question. Yes. Your question is very good. Hmm. You're absolutely right. And it's fundamental for non-compact manifolds. I mean, one of the basic problems is exactly the same problem we're dealing with for the complex plane. Right? Remember the Weierstrass product theorem. I don't know if you, you looked at that yet, but given a divisor on the complex plane in either, in either sense, allowing infinite, uh, there is a meromorphic function, almost canonical, which has it as its divisor. Okay, but is it clear what I'm saying here? If you have one of these divisors, which is defined locally like this, then the polar set and the zero set are well defined. You can stick them together. Hmm? You can stick them together. You, they, yeah, so you see, yeah, so you, in fact, it does happen all over the place, except in, in dimension one. Okay. So this is. And now recall the example, please. The example was x equals uh, this in C4, this determinant equation we talked about. It. This is the reason I wanted to talk about it. So this is this cone. This is a cone over the Zegri embedded P1 cross P1, so this is P1 cross P1. And we have Z2 uh, equals zero, let's say Z, I don't care, Z, I don't care, Z1 equals zero, this multiplicity, one, is it, okay, Z1, equals zero uh, is Cartier. But don't forget what Z1 equals zero is. It's, it's something like this face uh, together with this back face. All right, it's hard for me to draw it back in here. So it's, it has two components. This is Cartier, but Z1 equals 0, equals Z2 equals 0, uh, is, is not Cartier. It cannot be defined by one function. Remember, that's the point. I don't know if you recall that. Caleb, were you here when I discussed this example? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's a simple thing. I mean, if Z1 equals 0, then Z2 or Z3 is equal to 0. So those are two components, right? And say take one component, 0 equals 0 and Z2 equals 0 in this variety. This is something like this. Uh, so it's not. So this thing, say, is, is one of these things. So this is just this one, this face here. It is definitely not Cartier. So it's a delicate point. Uh, which value divisors are Cartier, but it's easy to check. This is just a little warning. About 
the subtleties that are going on if you ever get interested in the subject. In fact, it's smooth. Then, Yeah, Riemann services. You can define everything by a morphic function. By a local. 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 But you can stick the sets together. That's right. Well, yeah, locally, but not. Again, they fit. The poles and zero fit together locally, but you're not getting a, a global function. You're not getting a global function. Okay. And I must so, say, so Cartier divisor is actually a covering with the Merrimorphic function. Is that right. What right. Yeah. I should have put them. That's right. Uh, what you're saying is maybe here. What I should have said is the divisor is uh, two things. Given a divisor, is there a globally defined meromorphic function which has that divisor? I mean, that's, you can see that's a fundamental problem. It's an existence problem, a very deep existence problem. And we will talk about that all this week. This is answered. Um, let me tell you the answer to that problem. It is so beautiful. This answer is probably the most beautiful thing I've thought of in the last one hour. You know, you think about beautiful things. They're high points. I just thought of it again. And it makes me so happy to think about it, I have to tell you the answer. <clears throat> this, this is one of the high points of 19th century mathematics. Beginning, in some sense, of complex analysis in dimension higher than one. One of the beginnings. Look at this. Let X be a compact Riemann surface. Of genus G, but not P1. By the way, the only compact Riemann surface of genus zero is P1. That's it. There might be more, but and there's a theorem that that's it. Though. Okay. So let me just take an example so that I don't get mixed, mixed up with numbers. Let's take uh, genus three. defined by the canonical bundle, but defined by, by higher order, uh, something unbelievable, 
in a torus, in a g-dimensional, torus. Complex g-dimensional. So let me emphasize, I, I, I will talk about this later, but I want to talk about it now because I'm so excited. CG modulo a, lat a lattice, a torus, what you think? CG modulo a lattice. Let me em emphasize, this is a compact torus. This is a lattice of rank 2G. You know, you need 2G elements to make it compact. G equals 1, you need 2 elements. Okay. So here, this is a, a three-dimensional torus containing this thing as a curve. So... I don't know how to draw this three-dimensional torus. It's a three-dimensional torus. The g equals three, so this is three-dimensional torus. Oh, the I mean, okay, there it is. It's not very good. It's an embedding, so it's an embedding. It's a closed embedding. So it's going in here, going around, going around. Closed embedding. This is a Riemann surface. This, this mapping here is due to the great mathematician Abel. So I call this A for Abel's map. So this is the mapping. So this is the curtain, this is the Riemann surface X. So this is A of X. So Abel tells us, giving uh, here's the three uh, genus three Riemann surface. They're great names here. This torus is called the Jacobian of that surface. Or Jacobi variety of that surface. So this abstract guy, by the way, this is not only a torus. This is a very good torus. This is projected out the right torus. Well, this is a wonderful torus, where, by the way, the higher dimensional theory of theta functions and so on plays a huge role here. Uh, what does it mean to project it? It means it can be embedded in projector space. Okay. So almost no torus in higher gene, uh, dimension can be embedded in projector space. In dimension, okay? Almost not, but this one's a good one. And Riemann knew this. Jacobi knew this. Abel knew this. They didn't say, know how to say it, but they knew it. Now, this is, Andre Bay once wrote, if you read Andre Bay, once wrote, the goal is given a geometric object to find it sitting in a group. So you can, this object, you want to add the points. I mean, you would like to add the points. I'll give you an idea, I'd like to add the points. Well. If I have P1 here, P2 here, P3 here, and so on, I can add the points. Right? I can add them. Now, I must admit, I add them up and they're no longer in the curve. You can't expect the curve to be a group. Right? But you add them up and they're still in this torus. This torus is a group. This torus is the simplest group you can think of. It's not simple, but I mean, it's a group, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the simplest complex leading group or anything you can think of, right? Well, you could have, you could have this point here n, n1 times, and you could have this point here n2 times. So I'm putting it in here with multiplicity, okay? Now, guess. What is the dream theorem here? There exists a meromorphic function globally on the curve with this divisor out exactly what you want, exactly Mihai's dream. Mihai's dream comes true, true if and only if the sum of the points is zero. Now we're used to meromorphic function and the sum of the zeros and poles and all that, but this says the sum of the locations of the points. I mean. It's completely obvious. Is this, is this the 
resident theorem on the on the no, Riemann sphere? No, no, the resident. No, all these things are certainly related to residue, so I don't want to reject your, your comment outright. It's certainly related to residue. But it's much, it's much more. Just, just the one last one. Again, this is Abel's theorem. This is the deepest theorem in, in this subject, in my mind. The riemann roch theorem is a theorem I will prove this afternoon or tomorrow. Is in, in comparison, uh, it, it is not the same order of magnitude. Abel's theorem is a theorem in dimension one, and it is one of the goals of mathematics at large to produce Abel's theorem in dimension higher than one. And we do not know exactly how to do this. Again, do you want to add these? Put here, here, here's zero. You add these points up, and you've got to get zero. Incredible theorem. Weierstrass proved this for Tori. Abel proved it for any Riemann surface. Okay? Abel is the guy in the group, huh? Huh? With the groups. Yeah, yeah, okay. But this is, as usual, it's just like the Han-Banach theorem. is <laughs> named after Banach, but this is the most trivial theorem of Banach, maybe. But, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, but Abel, Abel is, is uh, you could think the Abel Prize is named after Abel. This is a great prize uh, given nowadays, and probably with it, quite a lot of money, and then you, if you win the Abel Prize, then you should think of this guy. Think that I told you about his theorem when you win the Abel's Prize. <laughs> it's beautiful. So I just wanted to end, because that answers your question exactly. And, and the beautiful thing is here, I move this thing just a little bit, right? No way. That just shows you how rare. I mean, this is not stable under earthquakes, right? You move small, one of these things, small business, it's not going to. Right. Very, very tough thing to get meromorphic functions with prescribed zeros and poles and compact. Obviously. But I think using group theory you can describe all this function. Uh, if you have a group and you just want to describe the sum of the like the elements that give you the Oh that's yeah, yeah that's a very interesting question. So you want to want to just right? I mean, you forget describe about the point. Embedding, you forget just, about embedding, and you just have to. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what you're saying, the trivial thing probably is, maybe it's also trivial. Describe the the point distribution so that the sum is zero. On the manifold. Oh no, 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 on the torus. I mean, just in the group. Oh, okay. This is that's what he's saying. That, yeah, but the points have to lie on the image of the Abel map, and the Abel map is given by integrals of holomorphic differential forms. <laughs> it's highly not trivial math. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So although it's very beautiful, so uh, it's, it's not a problem like if you if you find the uh, the setting of the points, then you can find the uh, <laughs> a manifold such that it, the, it's a beautiful question. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the inverse the, problem, right? Yeah, such so that the Apple map goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The inverse problem. Given given uh, the algebraically allowed points, find a curve going through those points. That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. right? uh, yeah. What's the question? So we have a torus of genus uh, dimension three. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's fix something. You want to find, find. Uh, so you do some algebra, and you find. Uh, let's fix the degree of the divisor. Say, uh, I don't know. The degree is zero. So you find. You want to find the uh, the the n one p one. Mk pk in the torus C3 modulo lattice so that the sum Nj pj equals zero. Mm -hmm. That's what Mihai suggests. I mean, that's some exercise. That's an interesting exercise. And now, okay, okay. So, yeah. given given all of these possible combinations, this find the curves that curve. go through. It's very interesting. Uh, even in dimension one, this theorem is very nice. <clears throat> okay, well, that's great. Thank you for your questions, and that's a good place to start. I'll, of course, continue.